Welcome everyone to this week's Cat's Eye on the Future. Tonight we have a very special show. We're interviewing Janet and Maggie and we're going to be talking about a whole lot of different topics probably. We're just having a conversation in Janet's lovely drawing room with a fire going and they're both, uh, they're both witches and so we're going to be talking a bit about divination and how it relates to the craft. But first I'm going to let Janet and May then Maggie tell you a little bit about themselves. Janet, would you like to go first? Well, I'm now considered one of the grandmothers of witchcraft, which I consider is quite an honour. Um, I've written many books with my late husband, Stuart Farrer. So anyone out there who knows me knows that it's Janet Farrer that you're talking to. Written many, many books on the subject of witchcraft. And um, I'm a priestess of Freya, who's my particular deity. And of course, she is oracula. And part of my job, living here in the Republic of Ireland, is to act as an oracle, as a seer, for a lot of the local community. Many of them are good Catholic women. Um, a lot of them still go to Mass on Sundays. But the village witch, who in Ireland is known as the Banfassa, has always been the counsellor, the wise woman that they go to visit. And somehow or other I seem to have fallen into that role. I'm really glad you said that because I had uh, sort of noticed that in my own psychic practice that that's sort of how people come to me. And I have the same kind of clientele, a lot of them are very good Catholics, and, um, but they, they sort of look at me as a counselor, which is good because I'm an intuitive psychic, so that's yes. more what I do. But it, it seems to be like almost a role that a village needs to have. Uh, I've discovered that ever since I came to Ireland in 1976, and I'm 64 now, so I've lived here since I was in my mid-twenties. And during that time, and you've got to remember that when you're 26, and especially you've moved to a new country, the last thing you expect is the local villagers to accept you as a wise woman. But in Ireland they were only too ready for it. They were desperate to bring back some of the old ways. As a farmer friend of ours said to us many years ago, if you scratch the topsoil of Irish Christianity you come at once to the bedrock of paganism. They've never forgotten their pagan roots and they've never forgotten the role of the Banfassa. Yeah, I was. It was a real interesting change for me coming from the states because in the states, in a lot of places, not not say for example California, but like when I lived in the deep south, th there's a real Puritan streak. And you, if you're a psychic reader, you sometimes have to hide your tarot cards or pretend you do something else for fear that someone's going to get really angry. And I worried coming to Ireland that people were, especially we, we came in like, I think it was 96 or 97, people were still pretty religious. And I, I thought, well, there'll be a problem. And instead it was kind of, oh, a psychic reader. The only problem we ever had was when we first moved here and we were living in a little place in County Wexford called Ferns. And one of the village pubs wanted to put on a display of cards, not psychic cards, not tarot cards, but all sorts of cards. And they knew that I had a collection of tarot cards and they said, can we borrow a pack? So Stuart, my husband at the time, there was a tiny miniature pack of the weight cards that we had. And those, by the way, today are quite valuable. And Stuart carefully mounted them on a board, the major arcana. And when I went to collect them after the weekend of the card festival was over, my cards had gone. And the landlord looked horribly embarrassed. He said, the village priest came in, took one look, dragged your notice down with the cards and burnt them in the pub in the fire. And I thought, that was my property. And I wanted to go and confront the priest. And the man who owned the pub said, don't even bother going there. He will make your name such mud in the community. And I thought, that's theft. Whichever way you look at it, that is theft. That's the only problem I've ever had with a priest in this country. And the irony is now I live in Kells in County Meath, and Kells is well known for the Book of Kells, which is in um, the uh, Trinity College in Dublin. And the Book of Kells is the most wonderful manuscript. Uh, I think it dates back to the 4th century, I can't exactly remember. But it's the four gospel to, uh, Gospels. It's a beautifully illuminated manuscript. So Kells is one of the holy arts of Ireland. Well, when I'd lived in this house for several years, there was a knock on the front door one Christmas, Christmas Eve, and there's the local priest standing on the doorstep. And I thought, he's come to convert us. He gave us the most lovely smile and he said, oh, you're the witches, aren't you? And we said, yes. He said, I don't know what it is you do this time of year, but have a lovely one. And we said, well, thank you, Father, and the same to you, etc." And he said, it's nice to have you in the neighbourhood. You're more than welcome. What a difference between the two priests. 
do, do they come to you for questions like on property and divorces and stuff? Because I get a lot of that. Um, I get a lot to do with property, a lot to do with businesses. Um, you get the usual teenage kids who want to know if they're going to get married and if they're going to, if the boyfriend's right for them, etc. But this is something I differ from, from a lot of people. I do not tell fortunes. I hate the tarot of being used for fortune telling. Um, I hate these tarot on lines. I hate these tarots done to the newspapers, etc. I do a lot of tarot over the internet for people. But I always say, if you are going to do the tarot, and I've been studying it since 1970, you must at least either be a trained counsellor or have a good knowledge of counselling. You certainly need to have an understanding of psychology. They should only be used for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is for counselling. Now, your intuition may well come into it, and you may well use that psychic intuition. And I get a lot of good feedback from the readings I give. But to just pick up a book on the tarot, learn it that way, and then use it to read for people is spiritually wrong. Um, it shows how it can work psychically. I had a very interesting case. This was, oh, about 12 years ago. A young woman came to this house with her friend, and they wanted their cards read. And I used the weight pack, the rider weight pack, and I laid down the cards, and I took one look at it, and I thought, I can't make head nor tail of anything the cards are saying to my subconscious mind. Nothing. But I got this incredible image come into my head. And I turned to her and I said, look, I've got to ask you something very serious. Does the man in your life drive a cherry red hatchback car? And she said, yes, he does. I said, I've got a message that you must pass on to him. I said, I have a feeling that that car is connected with his career and that sometimes he has to go up over the border into the north of Ireland to somewhere like Belfast. The next time he does that, tell him on this occasion, he must make sure that he wears a safety belt driving home, that he does not stop off to have a drink with his friends on either side of the border, and that he drives slowly. It's going to be a wet night, and I said, I've just had a perfect picture of a lorry sloughed across the road, and if he's driving fast, driving drunk, or not wearing a safety belt, he will plough into that lorry. And I cannot tell you what will happen, but it will not be good. Well, the poor girl went as white as a sheep. Now, normally, as a tarot reader, that is the last thing I want to say to someone, but I knew that message was directly from the gods and was so important. I did her friend's cards, etc., and the two girls went on their way. Two weeks later, another young lady turned up, and she was in the company of the friend. And they sat down, and the friend turned to me, and she said, you know that prediction you gave to the girl who came with me the other night about the car? And I said, yes. She said, she wants me to pass a message on to you. It wasn't her boyfriend. On that night, at the exact moment I'm reading her cards, her twin brother, who worked for the same company and drove exactly the same sort of car, was coming back from Belfast. Normally, he wouldn't bother with a safety belt. He always used to stop off for a drink with the lads and he'd drive fast. It was a wet night that night and some instinct told him, put on the safety belt, don't stop off for a drink with the friends, come straight home and drive carefully. It saved his life. It was her twin brother. She had mentally, without realising it, telepathed with her own brother, not even realising he was on the road that night. But he picked up on her emotion because, you see, the boyfriend was actually her fiancé. She had got engaged 24 hours before that original reading. So the connection was that strong with both men in her lives. And that is how the tarot can work. It can literally click in just like that because the tarot itself is tied in, as Jung said, to the collective unconscious mind. And that is why I say, if you are going to read the tarot, if you're going to do anything like that, take a course in counselling, study psychology. Forget what you read in the books, let the cards speak to your unconscious, your deep subconscious, the collective unconscious mind, and work it from there. But always end up on a good note. Because as I said to her that night, I said, if you tell your fiancé, or boyfriend at the time, because I didn't know he was the fiancé, if you tell him that, you'll probably save him having a terrible accident. I feel it's really important that you know that. You mustn't be afraid. He will be perfectly all right 
providing he listens to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. But of course, it was already happening because I was doing the cards. And that mere telepathy between twin brother and sister saved that boy's life. And and that was, I think one of the things about reading cards that I've noticed, and I, I read psych cards really more than the tarot, but they're based on the tarot, somewhat on the tarot, and they're done by a union psychologist, um, is, is that sometimes we do see things that we really have to figure out how to pass on that are pretty dark. So most of the time we try to avoid, I try to avoid giving that kind of information out unless I have some way to coach it that's positive. Yes, and because, you have to end on a positive note. Yeah, because, and, and, and I've had experiences too where people will, they know something's wrong already. Yes. That's also, also very, very common. And you can change the future. This is the whole point. You can change it. Um, I had another occasion where I was reading for a girl and I said, look, I said, the office you're working in, please get them to check the plugs, especially in the kitchen area. I said, I have a feeling that if you don't check the plugs, you may get, not with anyone in the building, but you may get a fire break out. And there's nothing in the tarot that can talk about that. And the next day she went in, because it was a small company she worked for, and the boss was part of her family, and they indeed checked the kitchen plugs, and they discovered it was shorting, actually in the wall itself. Well, I look at cards and runes as sort of partly... They have a power in themselves, yes, but they, they also do. are very much a psychic focus for intuitive readers. Yes, they are indeed. And um, this is why I feel so strongly when I, I see people, the way they read cards sometimes. It just makes me so angry because I'm thinking half the time you're not being aware of what you're doing. You are interfering with other people's lives. As I said, you can change an event. Okay, if somebody is going to die, they are going to die. But you don't turn around and say, oh, well, great, Uncle Fred's going to die next week. But if you see that, say, Uncle Fred should really be getting medical treatment, I will sit down afterwards and discuss with the person I've been reading for, what has Uncle Fred done? Has he seen the doctor lately? Because they will often open up afterwards and say, well, Uncle Fred's not been well for some time. We're trying to persuade him to go to a doctor. And I will discuss with the person concerned the best way to encourage Uncle Fred to make the right moves to bring him back to health again. So it should also be part of a counselling session. That is why you cannot do tarot online as such, even though, as I said, I do it on the internet, because I always make sure that the people I read for can come back, we can discuss, we can say, right, okay, where's the next move from here? Where do we go from here? They, they, they are not a toy. And too many people out there who call themselves psychic readers use them as a toy. For example, you get somebody who maybe um, ends up reading cards all day long at um, a shop in Dublin or something. You can't do that. It's detrimental to your own health, your own physical and mental and emotional well-being, let alone your psychic well-being. You burn yourself out. And that's the problem with too many people who are so-called psychics. And yes, many of them are genuinely psychic. They burn themselves out. So what do you do when you burn out? You make it up as you go along. That is spiritual cheating, spiritual lying. And it's something people really should consider. And I know Maggie would agree with me because, Maggie, you explained... What it is you used to do for a living before you retired? Um, well, um, if I get some clients here, I'll carry on doing it. Um, I'm a psychotherapist, um, so which ties in exactly to what um, uh, Jan's been saying. <coughs> um, my first uh, interest in the craft was um, just over 20 years ago. Uh, in actual fact, um, I'd done an access course into higher education and there was a break before going to university and I was go going to do a psychology degree. And in that time, I decided to teach myself how to cast a horoscope with the idea that I was going to prove that it was wrong and it was a load of rubbish. What actually happened was that the first five people who came to me were all of the same sign and they were all different. So feeling quite confident that I was going to show it was rubbish, did their charts and I found out why they were different because there is more involved than just the sun. Um, that convinced me that astrology uh, works. Uh, so um, I then read a book and in the introduction on astrology and in the introduction to it, it said that most, pe most people who become astrologers start out learning astrology with the idea that they're going to prove it wrong and the first few people who come to them come from exactly the same sign and I thought I've just done that so anyway that started my interest and uh, friends around me started to call me a witch 
and that led me to start exploring into the craft, which I started doing before I did my degree. The goddess that I was uh, attracted to and who I am a priestess of now um, is Hecate. She, of course, is goddess of the rules of the, uh, the sky, the land and the sea and also the underworld. She is a psychopompus. So, of course, I was going to study psychology. After I did that, I then went on to qualify as a psychotherapist and I practiced the craft on my own as a solitary and 10 years ago I moved to Bournemouth in the UK and I joined uh, in with covens there, uh, then ran my own coven and a year ago I moved over here to Ireland. Now, okay, going back to the point of uh, tarot reading, uh, I had clients, one client came to me and uh, said to me, do you read tarot? And I thought, strange question. So I said, um, why do you ask? And she looked over to my table, which had a green tablecloth on, and she said, because you've got a green tablecloth. Well, in actual fact, the tablecloth was my mother's, who had died, and basically was one of the things that I'd acquired from her. But as it happened, I said, well, yes, actually I do. And she asked for a tarot reading, so I read her cards for her. She knew enough about the tarot to actually be able to follow the cards with me. And she said to me, that is absolutely amazing. How did that happen? And I just looked at her and said, well, you shuffled the cards. So from that, I started to use the tarot as well and realized that it was a really good tool to use in counselling and psychotherapy and that's basically what I've done since. Well Jung himself used to use the tarot. Yes he did. Um, I mean his famous little red book which is a tome, it's not a little red book at all, it's a grimoire in its own right. Um, beautifully illustrated by Jung, well worth buying if anyone's interested in it um, because it is as I said a magical grimoire but he used to use the tarot a lot, he really understood the basis of the tarot and how it is tied in, as I said, with the collective unconscious mind. So this was one of his working tools. And okay, a lot of his ideas are dated now, and psychology has changed a lot since Jung's day, but he was one of the forerunners. He was one of the fathers of modern psychology. And because of the work he did, along with people like Adler and Freud, etc., um, psychology basically entered into a new phase it has educated itself, it has changed a lot of its ideas, it's grown up in many ways. But these forefathers, people like Jung, he was so interested in the occult and he realised how much it influences our subconscious minds. Yeah, I uh, the deck I use is called the Psychart deck and it's sort of, what I like about it is it's got a lot of the archetypes, some of which are the Jungian ones and mm. some of them are just kind of everyday stuff, but people can follow along with them a little bit easier. Yes. And I've also got a deck that's called the Psychic Tarot, which sort of expands that idea into a more a little more of a standard tarot. But in the Psychart deck, like there's a, a card with cards and wheels that says work on it. And I, I like it that my clients can 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 see that. And, and it means, and sometimes have you found that sometimes the cards mean something to your client that you've not even thought of? Oh, God, yes. Yes. Yeah, because yes. that's, a, I'm intrigued that we, I, there's a, I've heard another psychotherapist that's been on, I think, a very large radio show, much larger than this one, who also uses the tarot. Mm -hmm. And he's actually had people in the audience call up and he'll pick a card for them. And it's amazing how often it's just the right card. That's what usually happens with the, with the tarot. Um, the other interesting thing that, I, um, that I've heard um, that people do with the tarot card, and that is they might, say, do themselves a reading. And if they don't like the reading, they'll decide to do another one. And they end up, and they shuffle the cards again, but they end up coming up with precisely the, the same cards as they did the time before. So it's almost like you can't actually escape. <laughs> Which is interesting because you can understand why it used to be called the Devil's Picture Book. Yes, um, because if you think about it, people who are afraid of exploring these avenues in life don't realise that it is, on a deep level, humanity is so connected on this deep subconscious level. And the inspiration for these cards have come from our own deep subconscious minds. So in a sense, there is nothing mystical about them as such, 
but the powers that be. I, I never like in that sense to refer to it as, as the god and the goddess, although I believe in, you know, gods and goddesses. Um, I prefer to call it the divine DNA. It's behind everything ever created. It's, it's the, the wonder behind the universe. The wonder behind the universe speaks to us all, and the only way it can speak to our souls in a physical body is through that deep subconscious mind. So when the cards pop up again and again and again, and by the way, you should never read for yourself and you certainly shouldn't sit there every morning drawing a card thinking it's going to tell me how I should live my life today. Do I go to Starbucks or do I go to Burger King, etc.? Which some people do, but they can't live without it. That's when it becomes fanatical. Instead, you let them talk to you um, through somebody else, you know, helping you out with finding out things you need to know about yourself. And you may not like what the cards will tell you. But they are saying, here is a problem through that, what I call that divine DNA, saying, problem in your life, you need to address this yourself. This is your problem. Nobody can sort it except you. Deal with it. I would be curious, you mentioned the use of astrology as well. That's another yes. way of doing the future that I, I have been told by friends who are astrologers, it's often very interesting to them how when I'm doing cards of the day for current events, how often it will reflect the same sort of, and they'll say, oh, that's fascinating because, you know, Jupiter is aligned with Mars like this, and that's why, and it's and I'm getting it through the, car, through, you know, the cards. Well, it goes back to exactly what um, uh, Jan was just saying, that um, everything is actually connected, so um, because it's all energy. So that will happen, and yes, it does. We are influenced by um, the planets and where the alignments are. So um, that is not really surprising that uh, many forms of divination are all going to come up with the same thing. Would you mind talking a little bit more about astrology? And just for my audience that may not know, I mean, a lot of people read daily horoscopes, but not everybody is familiar with exactly what particularly Western astrology actually is and kind of a little bit of how it works. Right. Okay. Um, first of all, um, it's a waste of time really reading your daily horoscope because that's based on your sun sign, of which there are only 12. Uh, also, people were born on, you know, any particular month, um, not beginning of a calendar month, but, you know, where it starts from one sign to the next. Um, people are going to be born on any day of that month. So the sun isn't always going to be in the same place anyway. So they're not really going to be accurate. Uh, astrology is actually, when you cast a chart, you've got, okay, you know where the sun, the sun is and what your sun sign is. Most people know that. Uh, you also need to know um, the place that you're born and the time that you're born. So you've got the date, place and time. And then from that, the, um, the chart is, is cast and that will give you your rising sign but it also tells you where all the other planets are uh, around the zodiac. And also there are certain angles between them. Some are known as um, soft aspects, or if you like, benign aspects. Uh, some are more harsh. The harsher ones are the square and the upper, which is um, 45 degrees. Have we got that right? No, 90 degrees. Um, and some are oppositions which are 100, 180 degrees apart in other words the planets are opposite each other so that can give some sort of a conflict um, the softer ones are where energy flows more freely so if you really really want to know you know what is actually in your chart then you actually need to get a chart cast by an astrologer the other thing is um, as Jan was saying about um, the, you know, the cards, not fortune tellers, and people will often see astrology in the same way. It's not fortune telling, it's not fatalistic. It gives you influences and you can change, and you can change anything. It's just about being aware of what sort of things are there, but it's not going to tell you what you're gonna be doing today, tomorrow, who you're gonna meet or anything like that. Um, you know, usually what you start with is a basic personality profile, which will give you out of your strengths and your weaknesses. But those are things that you need to work on, not the sum total of what you are. And when it comes to um, what's called transit, so that is 
the relationship between where all the planets are now, say on say today, and the angles they formed where the planets were in your birth chart. And again, it's about influences, it's about possibilities. Nothing is set in stone. You are in control of your own life, nobody else. That's very, very interesting. I, I want to thank you for that. I've been trying to get an astrologer on the show for a long time. So it's really <laughs> great to just sort of, you know, they, they, you were just sent here and you happen to be here this afternoon, which is fantastic. I, I'm also intrigued with, you know, how you combine being a, a psychotherapist with being a psychic. I find that very interesting. Do you find it you wind up using some of your psychic abilities? Obviously, you're using astrology and things and tarot cards, but how um, does that work when, when you work with clients? Right, okay. Um, when I was doing my training and um, our tutor, we would do practice sessions with each other, okay? Uh, when we were doing that, and then all the others, um, you know, in the, in the group, um, would then um, talk about how they perceived what we were doing. And I would, did this with uh, well one of my colleagues actually and um, all the others were saying that they thought I was I'd gone in too quickly um, and you know they would have taken a much um, slower approach or whatever but my tutor said um, said actually Maggie would make, would make a really good intuitive psychotherapist so intuition does come into psychotherapy what it helps you to do is to know exactly where to go with the client. The client is talking. Um, you know, when, when somebody comes to a session of mine, the first session, they talk, I listen. And nine times out of ten, they'll say, well, I don't know where to start. And most people think of having to start at the beginning. And I say, no, it's your job to, to just talk. doesn't matter where you start. You just pour it all out from anywhere. It's my job to pick up the pieces. And that's what I do. And from what they are saying, I find it quite easy to pick up where to go with it. Um, what keeps on happening, what keeps getting repeated in what they're saying. Uh, and basically that's how I work with it. So basically I'd say that probably all three of us would be in our different ways, what I call intuitive psychics. Because mm. I get that all the time. I get calls, are you a fortune teller? Well, since I do it professionally, I'll say, yes, but that's not exactly what I'm doing. What, I, what I'm really doing, and I'll tell people that, I, that I'm really good at helping you figure out, like, if you've got a career choice, we can look at that. Um, but I'm not so good at telling you if you're, I can't tell you if your boyfriend's going to have green eyes. Yeah. Or your husband's name. <laughs> but, yeah. but I can tell you if you're likely to meet somebody in the next three years. You know, and maybe something about what they'll be like and, you know, that because that may come up in the cards. I've noticed with the cards and I suspect with astrology as well, that an awful lot of it, too, is you get the basic cards. I mean, the tarot, I know you get more information than you do with either the runes, which I also read, or the smaller decks. But then you have to rely on the intuition of the psychic flashes sometimes for more information. And I know when I first moved to doing it online, I really did wonder if everything was just subconscious pickup, which I'm sure that that's the official line of what you're probably doing with the psychotherapy is that mm -hmm. you're intuitive because you read people very well. Mm -hmm. and I, that's think many... one of the, I was just going to say, that's one of the joys about doing it over the internet. I can't see the person in front of me. I can't read their body language. And that's when I finally became convinced after, you know, decades that there really was for certain in the depth of my soul more to this than just that because I couldn't possibly yes. be reading someone that I could not right. see I, I could only I couldn't even hear I was just typing at right okay you know um, and uh, you know just sort of further to that I ha have actually done telephone um, consultations as well uh, and still been able to pick up right and and so, they're not, so it still it, works the same way yeah it's just it's just it's, there is something more going on yeah You have been listening to part one of Cat's Eye on the Future. We'll return to the show right after these short messages. Do you have questions? The cards have answers. If you would like a personal reading with Melody, just go to my website, MelodyPsychicReadings.com. That's Melody with an I. PsychicReadings.com for information 
or email me at melodyreader at gmail.com. Readings are available using Skype, phone, email, or even in person if you are lucky to live in Ireland. Why not find out what special messages the cards have just for you and book a private reading today? We now return to part two of Cat's Eye on the Future. I'd like to switch over a little bit now is the fact that you're both in what we refer to early as the craft. And again, for members of my listening audience that might not know, I mean, people have probably heard of the movie The Craft or, you know, all, you know, we see, you know, this is, by the way, I'm recording this the day after, after a Samhain or after Halloween. And this is what we used to refer to in some ways as our annual witches or people to uh, interview. Actually, it just happened that this date I was up here. So that's why we're doing this. But, you know, people that practice the craft, they get into the public eye usually once a year when every radio station and every TV station wants to come to your house and interview you. But the other 364 days a year, most of the time it's just kind of ignored or it's kind of just sensationalized. So could, could either of you like to talk a little bit about what it actually is and what it means to you? I mean, I realize this is, that's a topic that could go on for four hours, but just sort of a brief introduction. Well, I came into the craft when I was 20 years old. Um, to save a person's soul. I've been brought up a very good Christian, um, not strict in the sense of hellfire and brimstone, but enough to believe in Jesus. Oh, I still believe in Jesus, not the historical one, but the, what I call the cosmic Christ. He's just another aspect of divinity, etc. Good guy, much misunderstood. Um, and I went in to save a person's soul because I was sure they were going to get mixed up in something nasty. You know, I, mean, I must have been the only kid who went through the 60s didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs, and I was still a virgin. You work that one out. So I went to save this girl, so I'll get her out of it. Instead, I found a religion that actually amplified my beliefs in my concept of Jesus. So much so, I had a vivid dream where Jesus introduced me to the Virgin Mary. Instead of a bleeding heart, she had a pentagram, the symbol of witchcraft, under her gown. And the Jesus figure said, now you know, follow it. So I did. And it's led me to where I am today. Um, it's an earth-based religion, a very deep spirituality. And this is something a lot of people don't understand. It's not big pointy hats and broomsticks and cauldrons. Yes, I've got a cauldron, I've got a broomstick, I've got because I use that for weddings. It's a fertility symbol. You know, I get the bride and groom to jump it for fertility, not necessarily physical, but you know, sometimes mental fertility. In other words, to give them a nicer future. Um, but it's a religion that has a deep belief that the earth is sacred. She is a living organism. She is our divine mother. And as our divine mother, we're a small planet in the boondocks of the entire universe. We cannot understand the whole universe, which is a very violent place out there. But it's all creation. I always think that that divine DNA is learning like a child growing up. It's learning about itself. And this tiny little planet on the edge of the boondocks is also part of that learning process. And we are part of that learning process. We are part of that divine learning process. So it doesn't matter if you consider yourself a person who believes in just a single divinity, you know, like a Islam, Judaic, Christian, etc. Or if, like us, you're pantheists, or you just believe in a divine mother and father, it doesn't matter what you believe in in that sense. It is how you live your life following them. And as Wicca, which is its real name, um, and we are witches, we are not just Wiccans, we are witches. Wicca is the religion. Wicca or Wicca is a masculine and feminine of what we are. We follow that religion that looks upon this earth and says we need to love it, nurture it, look after her, our mother, because this is the mother that we were born onto, the mother who nurtures us from the time we came out of our mother's bellies, we have to look after her for future generations to give them a life here on this beautiful blue planet. Because it is beautiful, it's a little jewel in our solar system, that tiny, tiny solar system. And without the energy of this world, the oxygen of this world, the creatures of this world, it would just be a barren dead planet. And one day it will be. One day this planet will not exist any longer. But if mankind is to survive, the way we view this earth is going to be vitally important. 
That is why we call her a goddess, because in a sense she is. She represents everything feminine in divinity. And for those who don't know anything about the feminine in divinity, a long time ago, remember the Bible was not written by God, the Christian Bible, it was written by man. But the ancient Judaic faith, Jehovah had his bride, his Asherah, his feminine other half. As there are masculine and feminine in everything on earth, from plant to animal, so it is with the divine. And that divine feminine is, the best way to put it is actually to use a classic example of that wonderful painting in the Sistine Chapel. It is exquisitely lovely. It is Jehovah reaching out and touching Adam's finger. But who leans over Jehovah's shoulder? The Shekinah, as she is known in the Judaic. She is wisdom. There she is with her arms lovingly around her man saying, go for it, sunshine. Let's bring another life into this world. Let's bring something else into this world. And he embraces Adam and she embraces him. She holds Jehovah in her arms, that creator in the Judaic faith and also in the Christian faith. She whispers the words of wisdom into his ear. And that is what the earth does to us all the time. Our mother whispers words of wisdom to us. And so she needs to be honoured. She needs to be loved. She needs to be nurtured. And that is what witchcraft is all about. It is a priesthood. There is no pope. There is no hierarchy in that sense of the word. And there shouldn't be. We are servants of the divine. And as servants of the divine, we need to serve and love and look after all that is created. Because that is the gift from that ultimate DNA that we cannot understand. As my husband now, Gavin, says, it's like an ant trying to understand a computer. Forget it, it is impossible. Even in the Old Testament, and I have to use Christian and, and Judaic terminology for this, because that's what a lot of people understand, there's that statement, no man may look upon the face of God and live. Of course you can't. We're the ant trying to understand the computer. And as the infinite universe is still growing, new planets, new worlds are being born, so that divine creator, creatrix, the pair together, the union of that yin, yang, masculine, feminine, etc., is learning, educating itself. And as I sometimes say, I say to people who are Christian friends of mine, I don't even think it understands we exist. We are, we are part of its dream. We are part of it, but we're also part of its dream. You don't know every skin cell on your body. We slough millions of skin cells off every day. The same way people die every day. Animals die every day. Here we are in the middle of autumn, coming up into the depth of winter and the leaves are falling off the trees. But the tree still lives. It is the leaves that fall. And what do they do? They refertilize the earth. They go back to the mother. That's what happens with us. We have a lifespan. We go back to the mother. And don't forget, we are stardust. We came from that universe. We came from deep space, not just our tiny galaxy. We came from deep space. We are part of that universe here on this tiny boondocks planet. And we carry that divine DNA inside ourselves. And that divine DNA lives on through us, learns through us. And that's why we believe in reincarnation. We are energy. Energy is never lost. I do not believe that we come back as a cat, for example, and I'm very much a cat person, I love my cats. I do believe we come back, in a sense, the soul of who we are, where we fit into this divine picture. We come back to carry that knowledge forward. The same way my cat sitting over there fast asleep at the moment, Salem, she carries her divine knowledge forwards. Because certainly being a cat person, and a lot of people would find this really hard to believe, I have two altars in this room. One to the Egyptian cat goddess Bast, and my main altar to my goddess Freya, who is also associated with cats. I have sometimes got up in the morning when my cat Salem was a younger puss, and I'd walk in here, and she used to be a mighty hunter. And she would catch little bunny rabbits, baby bunnies. And of course, like most cats, she would kill them. But would she eat them? No, she would dissect them and put them in half. Half the cat's um, offering would be in front of Freya's altar, sometimes it'd be the head, and the other half would be in front of Bass's altar, the butt. Sometimes Freya would get the butt and sometimes Bass would get the head. But she would leave offerings in front of the both of these altars. Now, why the hell should an animal do this? You might say, well, an animal's got no sense that that's an altar to a cat divinity. So why should a cat leave offerings to its own god and goddess? That's just amazing. Um, I was thinking, we were talking about reincarnation. I was thinking about little Salem over there 
who's this lovely black kitty. Uh, she was actually born at my house many years ago. And I was thinking, you know, first she lived with me. And then when she was a kitten, she grabbed the hair of a visiting friend of both of ours. And then she went and lived with her. And that was like almost a second life. And then that young woman, I believe, had to go in the hospital. That's right. Yeah. And uh, Salem jumped in your car and came to live here. So that was like a third life. And it's always Salem. Hmm. But it's always the soul. But sometimes, did she ever change names? Yes, originally, when my friend got her from you, she called her Amber. Yes. And, and I looked at her and I thought, you're not an Amber. Because she's got these beautiful white walrus whiskers. And she's got little beady button eyes. And she was, a, as a kitten, she was the naughtiest kitten on earth. And that's why I named her after Salem in Massachusetts, you know, because to me, Salem in Massachusetts is it's a place which is over witchy. Yeah. And I mean that in the nicest possible sense. She was over witchy. So I thought, no, you are a Salem. You are definitely a Salem. And she has these button eyes that would look at you and challenge you and say, I'm a very witchy cat. Deal with it. And the interesting thing is, and I cannot remember, honestly, the name that we gave her as a kitten. But she was originally going to stay a barn cat with us, and she chose to have these other lives. And I just was thinking how that reminds me of what I think of as a reincarnation, is that, you know, sometimes we forget the names we had. Yes. And sometimes we remember them. And we're, but we do different things, and we have different phases, but we're always the same sort of entity or the same soul. Yes. You yes. know, I just... Very much so. You know, I think that's interesting. I'm curious also, do you, do you wind up using reincarnation at all? Do you find that interacts with your clients and your in your professional job? Um, obviously, my clients all come from different backgrounds with different beliefs. Yes. So how I go, how I work with anybody uh, depends on what they talk to me about. So, yes, I will um, go into stuff like that with clients who... Um, have that belief system, and surprisingly enough, quite uh, quite a few of them do. So, um, so yes, you know, you can work in that sort of way because it, again, the way in which you work as a psychotherapist, or certainly the way in which I work, um, is I work with the individual client, not my idea of what the client should be. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, you're dealing with an individual, and although when you train as a psychotherapist, you have a model. To work from but that is a model to work from you don't make a client fit a model if a client isn't you know if you if you can't put it anywhere you change change the model but you are talking to a person and all your model does is um helps to so, you can, so it's like having um a clothes peg on which to hang stuff i i think an organizing principle yeah i i may have misphrased it a bit what i what i really was do you sometimes find that at least in your opinion or when you work with clients that some some things are, are probably caused and or issues are caused from this life because this is when we're living but that there seem to be sometimes holdovers or patterns um right okay um i haven't personally encountered that which is not to say that there isn't but i don't do um past life okay. regressions with people um usually i find can find the source um in actually what has happened in the here and now, but that's not to say that there isn't a, a stuff combined, but, but primarily yeah. you, you find that that's really interesting. Well, to to go into to go back a little bit to the craft topic, when people think about witches, they often think about magic. And I was wondering if either of you would like to talk a little bit about magic and what that is and how that fits into this picture. Um, right, okay. Um, we live in a magical universe. The birth of a baby is magical. Um, we use what we call sympathetic magic. Now, sympathetic magic is actually imitating the desired result. Magic is about focus and intent, primarily. You have to have those things. And visualisation. So when, you, you know, when you're using magic, then you are going to use something that imitates the end result. Now... Very often people will think, oh, scary stuff, scary stuff. But, you know, for people who are Christians um, and Jews, don't realise that uh, sympathetic magic has always been used. And I'll just refer to uh, the story of Jacob when um, he works seven years for Laban because he wants to marry uh, Rachel. And when he's worked the seven years... Um, he's then given her elder sister because the elder sister has to 
be married before the younger one. So he has to work even longer for Rachel. But he does a deal with Laban. He says, right, OK, um, I will carry on working for you. But when I leave with his two wives, because they did have more than one wife then, um, we're, I will, we will divide the, the, the herd and all the speckled sheep I will take. Now, most people have heard of the Jacob sheep, the ones that are the two coloured ones. And Laban thinks, well, that's a great deal because there aren't any speckled sheep. They're all white. So what Jacob does is by the drinking trough, he takes a load of uh, branches and he strips off speckled bits of the bark and he puts them by the drinking tr uh, trough and all the sheep that mate on that side of the trough where the, the things are all give birth to speckled sheep and he ends up walking off with a huge herd of speckled sheep. Now that is sympathetic magic and magic was practiced by them. It was and it's still what we do today. Um, can you talk about that and how it relates to the craft itself? Because people think of, I mean, I, I know because I've, I've studied it, I know that the craft is, and Wicca are religions, but they also are in the minds of the public often mixed in with magic. And I'm just yeah. wondering how that, get a little bit about how that comes about and, and, and what is magic used for within as much as you can say within the craft and and perhaps in daily life. Because, I mean, yes, I've had Jacob's sheep, but most people probably don't have sheep in their backyard. Yes. So how would they relate that to living in a city apartment? Or right, okay. Because, because the principle I was trying to I was explaining there is that that is an example um, of sympathetic magic, and it is imitating the desired result. So whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, achieve you need um, to to do something that actually imitates that. Um, we a lot of what we do uh, is actually healing for people. And sometimes the person isn't there, so you can't work directly on them. And with their consent, uh, you would make a poppet. And you would make it look as much like them as you possibly, as you possibly can. Um, perhaps use a photograph, you know, for the face or whatever. Um, and then you would work on, on the poppet. So that's an example of, um, I mean, that's quite a simple example, sometimes a bit more complicated than that. But... That is a simple example of um, sympathetic magic, where you are working on something to achieve a result on something else. So basically, and you mentioned that you said with someone's consent. Uh, this is, I think, where the general public, probably not, most of my listeners are probably a bit more educated than that. But, you know, people get the idea of sort of good magic and bad magic. And in my mind, Bad magic would be doing to do something without someone's out their consent or coercing somebody as yes. opposed to doing something with their consent for healing or yeah. what would be some other things you would use magic for? Um, getting a job. Oh, no, that's a good one. Uh, how would you go about, how would you suggest to somebody if they, you know, if it were just somebody were to call the show and say, I'm looking for a job. How would I use magic to get a job? Can I answer a bit yes, of that, Maggie? Yes, yeah. The answer to that is quite simple. Step one, decide what it is you want to do. Yep. Step two, don't sit on your fat backside and yep. hope it's going to drop in your lap. It is not. If you want to do something that is going to require further education, go to night classes, take further education in one form or another. Don't turn up at a job interview just sitting there expecting to smile sweetly and get the job. Show that you are confident, that you have dressed smartly, that you are willing to ask intelligent questions, etc. 90% of it is to learn to help yourself. When it comes to the magical side, then you decide, right, okay, tomorrow I'm going for a job interview. I've got myself dressed the way I want to be. I know how I'm going to behave. I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to be confident. Do something as simple as take a candle. And a lot of people say, well, you should use candles with this colour and candles of that. You can't always get your hands on coloured candles. Just take a candle, put it in front of a mirror, light it and look at your own reflection in the mirror and at the candle burning in that mirror. Look through the flame at your reflection and say, tomorrow I will have the strength of this candle flame. 
Tomorrow I will have the brightness of this candle flame. Tomorrow I will be willing, as the wax is willing to melt, to listen to what I am being told I need to have for this particular career. Concentrate on it and say, I am confident I can do this. I am confident because I need to be able to achieve the career I want. I need to be able to put, uh, put food on the table for my family, etc. It's a 50-50 thing. Um, there's the old joke. Um, it's actually a Jewish one, so I hope any Jewish people won't be offended by this. But a, a Jewish gentleman goes into the synagogue every Saturday and he prays that he's going to be able to win the lottery, etc. Nothing happens. Next Saturday he goes in, still nothing happens. Third Saturday he goes in and he says, Lord, I have been faithful to you all my life. I need to put food on the table for my family. I need to win the lottery. And a beautiful voice comes out of the divine. And Yahweh himself turns around and says, do me a favour, Jaime, buy a damn lottery ticket. It's got to be a 50-50 exchange. And you can say the same thing about the witch who goes to the magic circle and does exactly the same thing. And the goddess basically pops them over the head and says, wake up, sweetheart, smell the roses, get off your knees, stop worshipping me, go and clean your act up and go and get that damn job. So what is the difference between a prayer and casting a spell? Very little. At the yes. end of the day, very little. But a prayer as a spell is absolutely meaningless unless your heart and soul are into it. It is no good just, for example, if you're a Christian walking into a church on Sunday, getting down on your knees and praying for favours. It's got to be a 50-50. You've got to give something back in return. You know, even the idea of the, the good, gentle Jesus figure, he's not going to accept you on your knees going, oh, hail Father in heaven, you know, blah, 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 etc. He's going to say, get off your knees and clean your act up. Get working. Do what I did. Go out and feed the poor. Look after the hungry. Okay, even if that means that you're walking through a supermarket and you suddenly see a little collection box for, say, guide dogs for the blind, and you've got 5p left in your purse, then put it in the damn box. Get off your backside and do something practical. It's an exchange of energy. The divine likes an exchange of energy. It likes you to be able to do something, and in exchange, it will help you. But you can't just sit there and hope you're going to be able to achieve a miracle by saying, please, God, help me. And God will say, stop being so bloody lazy. Is this related at all? Like when I do readings, I've noticed over time that things like to balance. I do a lot of current event That's readings. Right. That kind of, yeah. And I, I, I talk about active periods and inactive periods. Yeah. And I think this sort of comes over into that too, because it seems to me the universe is always going for balance. Yes, yes. it is. It never quite makes it, but it's always sort of headed. It's in trying to. It's the false it's like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's like a pendulum, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it swings a little bit that way, a little bit that way, but it's trying to, it, but it's trying to come back to centre. Yeah. And the number of times I've found, for example, um, I've got friends in this world who have raised families, they are good people, and then suddenly the whole world just falls apart. And then they, they say, I can't handle this, you know, why has this happened to me now? And then they look back and they see a repeat pattern from something in the past that's happened way back in the past. And they go, that's history repeating itself. And then they wake up to the realisation, I'm being given a chance, a fresh start. I went through hell, I went through pain, I went through tears, I went through heartbreak. But suddenly I feel so good because I know I've got a fresh start. And sometimes you have to learn a lesson the hard way and it is painful and it hurts. And you can either sink into the deep depths of despair or you can hit rock bottom and come up again like a cork saying, I will face the challenge. And sometimes those simple words, I will face the challenge, can change your entire life. Oh, it's going to hurt. It's going to smart. It's going to make you sometimes physically ill, emotionally ill, and sometimes even mentally ill. But the moment you turn around and say, I will fight back, then the universe goes, well done. Now I'm with you. Now we can work this. Yes. Now, one thing I would be curious, I, I believe that there's something like the wheel of the year. Could you explain a little? Because the whole idea of cycles and the different things like that. Well, as we know, our life goes in cycles from birth to death. You know, we go from the day we are born, we are helpless. We start growing and learning. Um, we go through all the emotional turmoil of hormones, the waking up of sexuality, etc. 
we hopefully find a partner in life and you have that happiness. If you're a woman and, you know, for example, you want to become a mother, you go through motherhood. So first of all, you're, you're the bright young maiden. You know, everything's optimistic. Sexuality is waking up. Every boy looks the greatest thing on earth or every boy to boy or girl to girl or any combination in between. And then you go through this maternal. And by the way, that can apply to men as well. Men make great mothers. Yes. But what happens is you go through all of this period in your life, which is a turning in on yourself. It's a nurturing time when you look after the family, you look after people around you. And all the time you're learning wisdom. And then, of course, you get older and the bones begin to ache and creak. And believe me, at 64, I do know that one. And your teeth aren't as good as they used to be and your hair's not what it used to be. And you look back at all these bright young things and think, do I really want to be like that again? No, because now you've learned a lot of wisdom. You accept who you are. It's an acceptance. And you know that gradually you're walking towards those gates which we call death. And it's going to happen to all of us. It's inevitable. If you're born, you're going to die. And you just hope that your death's going to be a nice one and, you know, not run over by a car or dying of cancer or what have you. But mind you, look at the number of brave people who go through cancer and die and they, they still, you know, they fight all the way. So we go through all of this in our lives and these are all cycles that we have to go through. And the wheel of the year is the same. It's tied into agriculture. From the first stirrings of spring, which in Ireland is called Lola Breed, um, in Christianity she is the goddess Bridget, um, Breed, to paganism, she is pre-Christian, she is the, the lady breed herself, and it comes from a word imolog, in the Irish it means in the belly. In other words, the first seeds are grown from the earth. And then we get, of course, the spring equinox, and during the spring equinox, life is waking up. It's, it's the joyous time of the year. The earth is waking up and shaking off her feathers and giving us all the beautiful colours and flowers of the promise to come. And then, of course, we have the great fire festival, which is Maeve uh, Bieltana in Irish, Beltane in English. And that was a time when the young folks were getting their um, act together and running off into the woods and copulating. You know, and the, any babies were born were known as, um, from a greenwood marriage, basically. And they were called merry begots because they were believed to be the child of the god, the child of the divine, etc. And that's the time when the earth is really getting ready for summer. And then we have the summer solstice, when the height of the sun is at its zenith. And hopefully, for all the agriculturalists by then, and also people you know, who keep cattle, etc., the earth is good, there's enough feed to fatten your animals up, there's enough on the ground for the crops to grow strong and healthy. And it's a time of summer and sunshine and laughter and all those things that kids like, like going to the beach and surfing and flying kites and do what kids like doing. So it's, it's a good time of year. But it's the turning time. Life is beginning to change because we're heading towards the winter. And then after that comes basically the beginning of the harvest. Lammas, autumn eve. And at Lammas, it's the time when you're watching to see how the harvest crops are growing. You're reaping the first harvest of the earth. And the autumn equinox, when we start getting the hunter's moon and the harvest moon, etc., all coming in together. Here in Ireland, that's the time you actually see the tractors going up and down after dark, bringing in the corn, the grain, the stubble from the fields, etc., burning the stubble on the land. It's the time of sacrifice. It's the time when the earth has done what she's done. And it's a time to give back, to give back, to allow her to rest, recuperate. Winter is coming. Things are going to sleep. Things are going to die. It's as simple as that. And then we come up to Halloween, to Samhain night itself. And Samhain was the ancient Celtic festival of the dead. It was the time when, as we said, the veil was very thin between the physical world and the spirit world. This was the time when, as it was getting colder, the older people of the tribe started to get sick. A time when people would begin to die. Winter was coming on. It was a time of sacrifice in the sense that way back then, the older cattle would be taken out into the fields and they would be ritually slaughtered as an offering to the gods because you couldn't keep all your livestock alive over the winter. You kept the younger, healthier ones, your breeding stock, but the old or the sick were put down. And they were offered to the gods, and that meat was then dried for the winter to keep your tribe alive, because you had to have hot food in your belly in the winter months. And then, of course, it comes up to the, the depth of winter itself. The opposite of the summer solstice, you've got the winter solstice. And that was the time when it was so dark, because remember, Samhain would have been the equivalent of their new year, but this time it was so dark. Would spring come back? Would the festival of lower breed come back? Would the earth begin to wake up? The seeds sprout from the earth? 
you don't know. It's dark. There's not very hour, many hours of daylight. There's darkness all around. The old and the sick are set, you know, certainly dying now. And you keep the tribe huddled and try to keep it warm, keep it alive during the winter. And of course, this is where some of our traditions come from. The burning of the Yule log, the centre fire being kept alive all the time. Because it would have been the centre fire in maybe the long houses, the long halls. As long as you kept that fire burning, you keep warmth for the tribe. And of course, also, the idea of the Christmas tree, it's a mimicking its sympathetic magic again. You bring an evergreen tree into your house, representing the fact that it cannot die. Something has to live. Your lovely little Christmas tree, with it, preferably one with roots on it, which you can plant outside afterwards. There it is, growing in your house, a symbol of life. And what do you do? You decorate it with bright lights. It's starlight, it's sunlight. You put the pretty baubles on it. They represent the planets and the stars and everything. Child's wonderful imagination looking at the wonder of the Christmas tree. And what lies under the Christmas tree? All those wonderful gifts, all those lovely things wrapped in paper, all that delight to keep the children happy. It's again a representation of giving to the tribe, giving something back to the tribe, keeping the children alive, keeping them laughing in the tiny, tiny part of the year when it is so bitterly cold that you don't know if spring is ever going to come again. And so there you look at your Christmas tree now in so many houses across the world and so many of them think, well, it's a lovely tradition, but they don't realise how pagan it is. You have literally created the living little universe in your own home. You have given your children starlight, sunlight, the planets with the baubles on the tree, even the glittery tinsel. That's all the dust that you see on cobwebs in the morning on your hedges. Everything that glitters and sparkles with frost, etc. And even Father Christmas himself, he's an old god, he's Odin. He is the wanderer in Norse mythology between the worlds, between the villages. He is the, the psychopompus, he is the seer. He is there, held in generations and remembered long before St Nicholas, wandering from clan to clan, village to village, tribe to tribe. He is the, the god figure who stays there watching, watching. He can control life, he can control death. You don't know what he's going to bring. But there he is, watching over your village, nurturing it through those dark winter months. There is Odin himself, watching, waiting, and eventually becoming reborn as Father Christmas, who later became St Nicholas, Santa Claus himself. Even Santi is an old pagan god. And all the time sleeping under the earth is the mother. Mother Earth herself waking, watching, nurturing the seeds, keeping them warm. Anyone who lives in the countryside, I can tell you this, even when it's really cold and if the ground is still soft, you know, not hard frozen from snow and frost, and you go outside and you plunge your bare hands into the earth, you can feel the heat under the soil. You can actually feel the heat generated by the magma at the core of planet Earth, of our mother, and there she is, and you just sink your hands into that mud, and it is warm to touch. Which is why I always say to somebody, if you're outside and you're really cold, don't be afraid to put your butt on the earth. You'll actually feel the heat rising through your own body. She's warming it, she's nurturing it, she's keeping things alive. Otherwise, animals couldn't hibernate. You think of the, the little hedgehog, for example, or the badger who goes and hibernates in the middle of winter. Everything that goes underground and stays underground, even the little squirrel in its nest, they hide away during the winter with their stocks of food. Or, you know, like some animals, they have stuffed themselves so that they've got enough body fat, like bears, for example, in America, you know, when they hibernate. They go into this hibernation in this deep sleep, and Mother Earth protects them. She keeps them warm during the winter, so that when they come out in the spring, they're full of the joys of spring, and mating begins, and new life begins again. That was really awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, I think at this point it's been about an hour. And before I let everybody go, I'd like to give each of you the chance to, if you have a website or anything you'd like to give out, so people can contact you if they'd like to. You were mentioning about hoping to get some clients or anything, if you'd like to give a contact. I actually don't have a website. Okay. Um, but I am on Facebook. 
Okay. Um, under the name Maggie Lloyd Davis. So I suppose if anybody put that in, so just put they in could Maggie, message me. Maggie Lloyd Davis. Mm -hmm. Or also I'll try to put that up on the show notes as well. So if anybody yeah. wants to contact you for, for any reason, they, they can do so. And, and yeah. Janet, do you have a website for your... Uh, yes, you can contact us at all... Um, I think it's small case. I'm going to have to ask Evan. It's J for Janet, S for Stuart, Farrah, F-A-A-A-R, F-A-A-A-R for Donald. J for Janet, S for Stuart, Farrah, F-A-A-A-R-A-R at Aircom, E-I-R-C-O-M dot net. Yes, and I believe there's also a website, and again, I'll try to have those linked in, in the show notes. But would it be useful to have my email address? Um, yes, and, I, and would you like to give me your email address? <coughs> yes, okay. Um, it's right, it's all lowercase. It's Maggie, M A G G I, Maggie, again, M A G G I S U. So it's Maggie, Maggie Sue. No E's in it. At AOL dot com. I want to thank you both for being here this evening. And uh, I want to say to my listeners and everybody, good night from Cat's Eye on the Future. Good night, darling. Good night. <laughs> You have been listening to Cat's Eye on the Future, the show where we take a look at what's coming up in your world and your future. Join us again next time for another episode of Cat's Eye on the Future. Cat's Eye on the Future.